Their own intelligence community has assessed that the Afghan government will likely collapse. That is not true. The first big city to fall was Kunduz, one after another. Afghanistan's biggest cities outside of Kabul were captured, Herat to the west. Terrorists in Kabul carrying out the deadliest attack on U.S. troops in over a decade. Afghanistan is lost. Move it! Freedom came under attack. On my orders, the United States military has begun strikes. At my direction, a small team of Americans carried out the operation with extraordinary courage. They killed Osama bin Laden. Al-Baghdadi is dead. It's time to end America's longest war. We'll do it responsibly. Rushing to the airport, behind them, the sound of gunfire. Deliberately. Countless Afghans who helped American troops were left behind. And safely. Afghans by the thousands desperate to escape life under the Taliban. Today I'm sitting down with ACLJ Senior Advisor for National Security and Foreign Policy and former U.S. Ambassador to Germany, Rick Grinnell. Ambassador Grinnell formerly served as Acting Director of National Intelligence under President Trump. He also served the U.S. at the United Nations under President George W. Bush and holds the record as the longest serving U.S. spokesman in history at the U.N. Grinnell possesses extensive knowledge on foreign policy and national security. It's September 1st, and we are here with Rick Grinnell. Rick, I wanted to talk to you about not only the present situation in Afghanistan, we're technically a day out now, more than a day, as we found out, uh, out from the full withdrawal, if you will, of Afghanistan, though we know uh, that not ne isn't necessarily 100% accurate. But for you, I wanted to go back, I think for, for people my age, mid-30s, anyone who grew up sort of in the you know, 9-11 happened when we were 15, 16 years old. That's really when we became aware of, of Afghanistan. That's when Afghanistan became a, a uh, something we spoke about other than, you know, when you learned the nations of the world. It, 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 was, it didn't feel real. It wasn't a place. For you, though, someone uh, who was working at that point, starting to get into your career politically, geopolitically, uh, where was Afghanistan for you? What would, you know, even pre 9-11, was it something that you were connected to, aware of? I'm, I'm just curious as someone who very quickly would work in, you know, get very deeply involved very early on in what became the war on terror. With September 11th, um, I was working at the United Nations. I was the American spokesman for the US mission to the UN. And that all changed for us. We immediately knew about Afghanistan and I was uh, flooded with not only information about the country, but immediately flooded with intelligence about what was happening. And so uh, I, I think my first reaction is being the new kid uh, sure. learning about the the situation of 9-11, the fallout afterwards and how this happened immediately gave me a pause. And when you look back and we now see from the 9-11 report, we actually did know each individual piece. We just didn't put it together. And so I think from, from my early uh, thinkings about Afghanistan, it seemed like an intelligence failure immediately. And that will come up a lot, I feel like, in this conversation we'll have what seems to be uh, whether leadership failures or intelligence failures and maybe the last 20 years, how those have all kind of unfolded. But being that being your first job working at the UN, what were the emotions like then working in that administration and or really in the UN in, in that time in a post 9-11 society? It did feel very, you know, as a kid, someone in their teens, early college age, it, it was a united time in some ways for America. It feels vastly different from how this war ended. Uh, you know, we, we, we became very united at that moment. You, you didn't see party lines. People uh, rallied behind President Bush at that moment. Uh, it became a very different experience. And, and obviously we were in a pre-social media world. We were in still sort of the infancy of, of the internet, at least high-speed internet by any means. Uh, that tone has changed so drastically. But what was it like being there during that time 
uh, even from, like I said, from a leadership standpoint. After 9-11, I think George W. Bush seized the moment. He did not run on the issue of terrorism at first. He talked about compassionate conservatism. He was the guy that was going to reach out and solve some of our immigration issues. Uh, the Republicans were uh, having a hard time thinking about, um, you know, who could come here. And suddenly what we found is because George W. Bush seized the moment in September, remember eight months, seven months into his administration, 9-11 happened. We remember those iconic moments with George W. Bush at ground zero, immediately talking to all of us saying that the people who tore this tower down, they're gonna hear from us collectively as Americans. And I remember being at the UN and we had unanimous support across the country, across the globe. We had Americans of all political stripes that were supporting us, and we had countries around the world that all were clamoring to say to the United States of America, what can we do to stand with you and Western values? That time at the UN when I was there was a time of unity unlike anyone had ever seen. Now, I was new to the UN, and it just, you know, my first foray into the UN at that point was really uh, exciting because I felt like the UN was meeting its uh, stated goals of 50 years ago, where we would all come together and work on uh, issues moving forward. And we were united, but that quickly did not last. As Soon as we uh, began to talk about who was responsible and how to punish those individuals, then it started to collapse. When we decided that we wanted to um, hold people to account, we even lost some of our Western allies who I think didn't want to uh, push further military action. They didn't want to hold people responsible. And then I, I have to say, Logan, um, we moved the, the punishment um, against those who knocked down the tower to make sure that Afghanistan would not be a safe haven for terrorism. We moved from that idea where we were all, we were all unified to punish those responsible and we moved into democracy building and, and trying to change hearts and minds. And that obviously is when things started to fall apart and we lost the vision. So looking back on that, it's been 20 years since the, since the war on terror began. As you said, initially, most of America united to take out the threats, to take out the enemies, to go after Al Qaeda, to go after Osama bin Laden. You know, 20 years later, almost a, an eerily similar timeline as now President Biden was in office. You have this catastrophic event that now happens instead of on our soil in Afghanistan. And a nation goes, definitely does not unite under this moment. This is a, a really sad and disheartening moment for everyone because we all are watching this imagery in real time. But 80% of the country did believe that we should get out of Afghanistan. You stated that, President Trump stated that. Your time in the Trump administration, how would have things looked differently? I think that's a question a lot of people have. Okay, was this the inevitable? Yes, we discussed that maybe nation building wasn't the best idea. Maybe there wasn't the inherent patriotism that is in Americans. We kind of tend to try to export that. And maybe that's not the necessary uh, solution to a lot of these occasions. But you do look back at what went wrong and we can point it a thousand different ways, but from your point of view, and we're gonna hear from dozens of people with all different points of view on this, what would have changed? What would have been so significantly different from the plan that was in place under the Trump administration to what now has unfolded uh, in this you know, horrific time? Look, I, I think Donald Trump's stated focus on protecting U.S. national security and responding when our uh, U.S. national security is threatened uh, and responding immediately when, when it's threatened is the right focused. We should use the military. We should use the power of the United States very judiciously. And I think the only criteria to use the military is when we have an immediate threat to our national security. I think Barack Obama um, tried to focus on that and talked about bringing our troops home, but didn't make a lot of headway. Uh, Donald Trump ran on that issue. And from the moment Donald Trump got into office, he was telling uh, our military leaders, our intelligence leaders, to uh, 
find a way to get out of Afghanistan and Iraq. Let's wind down these wars. Let's not have nation building. Let's go back to uh, the idea that we are focused on protecting our U.S. national security. When there isn't a threat, then we should pull back and uh, finish the job. And that's where I think that we started to get wrong. Donald Trump tried from the very beginning to wind down and get all of our troops home. He did a fantastic job of getting us lower, but we weren't able to take every single troop out. The information was changing. Military leaders would come and say, well, we need uh, a little more time. We need to push back the Taliban or keep sending strong messages to the Taliban. So I think that's a long answer to your question no. to say what would have been different. And the difference is, is that Donald Trump was listening and responding accordingly to the real time information on the ground while keeping the goal of getting us out of Afghanistan, bringing our troops home. He still was able to use the information from the military and adjust accordingly. He wasn't always happy about it, but he would adjust according to the information. And this is where I think President Biden has failed. He's failed to listen to the facts on the ground and that proved to be a disaster. Yeah, that August 31st date, it was earlier uh, in the President uh, Trump's administration, but August 31st became this date that felt very arbitrary. And it was September 11th, and that is maybe a too, too symbolic. So it was moved to August 31st. And when we see, and that was yesterday, but I just have that feeling that when you, like you said, that things would have been adjusted. You see the threat that's happening on the ground. You see, you know, our servicemen getting, you know, put in, in horrible harm's way, and many of them are dying. I just can't imagine this would have been the same situation, that we would have even had, number one, that happen with the intelligence that you all had, and that we would have now said, well, it's still August 31st, sorry, we're we're just abandoning ship and getting out of here because you know what better could be done and leaving potentially hundreds of people, hundreds of Americans, and thousands and thousands of people who for the last 20 years, a lot of people's whole life, we have shown them freedom, we have given them freedom. You're talking about the nation building. Whether we liked it or not, it happened. So now we're just abandoning people who have lived under at least some kind of freedom the last two decades. And it doesn't sit well with Americans. You can see it in the reaction. We don't like these imagery we, we imagery, and we don't take that lightly beyond even just our own people. You go, you see the people who are trying to come over to this country and sure they need to be vetted and make sure these people are who they say they are. Uh, but these are people who, who have a lot of them have never lived under this kind of oppression. And now we're just saying, sorry, you know, our hands are up. Now what we have, I think, are frustrated Americans watching as political timelines dictated our 20 year withdrawal from Afghanistan. We didn't do it on our timeline. We did it when the Taliban said, get out. We did it messy. We left 10% of the Americans oh, there. Wow. And I never thought I would see a day when the president of the United States would be proud to say, I got 90% of the Americans out. But that's exactly what President Biden is saying. And that change, you know, that change from, from the talking points. The talking points were, we're not leaving anybody. There, no one's gonna be left. And this was just, and it's crazy to think, Rick, that this has all happened in a matter of weeks when we're recording this. People may be seeing this 10 years, 20 years in the future, because I wanted people to see the raw emotion that, that people are going through right now as it's happening, because it's gonna be easy in a year, two years, three years, media changes, news stories change, to forget the emotion that people are going through right now. That just a few weeks ago, we were told not only was it gonna be 90 days, maybe until the Taliban took over, we we're also told you're, we're getting everybody out, we're not abandoning anyone. Uh, and now we've essentially, as you said, have said, yeah, it's fine, 10% of the people, isn't that great? We got almost everybody out. Uh, yeah, sure, not only 10% of the Americans, but it's 10% of the people who are saying, no, it's 10% of people that wanted to leave, not just people who decided to stay, people that wanted to leave uh, and we left behind. And, and again, I don't think that kind of rhetoric, even politically, sits well with people. They don't like to see that. We've seen the polls, but let's talk about intelligence. You know, you were uh, the director of, of national intelligence. How does that change now under a Taliban-ruled Afghanistan. It feels like just getting the information now that you need uh, it could be a mess, but or is this an intelligence problem or is this a, a leadership problem? What I would say is this certainly was a political failure. It wasn't an intelligence failure. 
And that's because our intelligence officers give estimates. They, their job is to provide estimates to policymakers. They estimate what's going on. It's not a science, it's an estimation. And so we have to remember that in the public, that intelligence is not perfect. Um, it's the best estimate that the intelligence officers can give at the time. That information is given in private and in confidence to policymakers so that they can make the best decision. You can't guarantee that you're uh, gonna minimize civilian casualties. If you're trying to pinpoint an airstrike, for instance, into a building, and you wanna know, have all of the civilians left, are we just going to target ISIS or you know, Al-Qaeda? Are we just gonna get the ones who are working on the terrorist activities and programs? And I think the reality is, is that many of these bad actors will invite civilians into buildings. They'll invite civilians around them to protect them, knowing full well that countries like Israel and the United States are painstakingly going through the process of making sure that we, we don't uh, include civilians. Now, mistakes are made, obviously, but there are very few governments that work really hard to make sure that civilians are not caught up in the crossfire. And when it does happen, there are even fewer governments that will apologize, say something went wrong, and uh, try to fix uh, and come clean on, on that problem. Some of it feels like a strength issue or even uh, showing strength to some of these. Like we had the intelligence, we were all even publicly on the news warned that there potentially would be these attacks on uh, the airport, that we knew that there was something going on. And historically, it feels like when that kind of warning comes through, uh, it scares people off. It scares the terrorists from trying. Uh, they change their plans. They see that they've been had. Uh, that didn't happen this time. Uh, we had the warning. We had the intelligence, but we didn't have the leadership or the ability at that point to subvert this attack that ended up taking, you know, 10, 12, 13 means going up of our own service people and hundreds of others. Look, I think uh, what is gonna come out, and again, we should remind people that this is just days after we've left yeah. and we do not have all of the information no. yet. But I think what we will see is a lot of military intelligence officers will say uh, th that was a bad decision to put everybody at Kabul airport. Why didn't we keep Bagram open? Why are we making everything happen in an inner city area where you can't control the area? Bagram is way out. It was easier to control who was coming in and we could have had checkpoints that were blockaded, you know, miles away before you actually get into Bagram. But all of this was not done because Joe Biden was very focused on keeping our troop presence as small as possible as we left. There wasn't a design to say, how do we win this and get out in the best possible way? He, he was uh, really wrapped with trying to have a specific date that the Taliban said you had to be out. And, and that's where we went into problems, is that we, we were butting up against a deadline that wasn't comfortable, that wasn't the best for the United States, and yet we kept to it. Yeah, and that's something I think that's important for us to, to look back on, not only look forward to see what could happen with Afghanistan and that whole region of the world, I assume, uh, it, it very likely could become another hotbed of, of terrorism, because we've seen uh, just in the last few years, last summer, when we were all talking, Rick, and discussing, we kept saying on the air, no one's talking about ISIS. No one is talking about what's going on in the Middle East. Israel's relatively quiet. All of these situations were relatively quiet. It wasn't even really a topic in the political debate, in the political sphere. But we kept telling people, just wait. Because this seemed, and look, it was just sad to say, it just seemed to be the inevitable. And you look at the 20 year war in Afghanistan, Obviously, and, and it's something to speak to our servicemen, our troops, there were 20 years there of, of successes that did happen, at least 10. You could at least say 10 years successes, maybe 10 years too long, but 10 years of successes. People were there for a reason. And these guys all fought and put their lives on the line for a reason. But unfortunately, a lot of people are going to judge this by the ending. You know, it's kind of like a, a movie. I mean, the movie can be great until the last scene. And at the last scene, they blow it you'll never think of that as a good move. You're gonna be like, well, that was horrible. I'm afraid 
that in many ways, as someone who like you who was involved in the very early stages of this, people will look back and just remember the ending when so many people did give up their lives to not only protect American interests, but to at least do their best and what their mission was at the time. Such a good analogy. And to keep to that analogy, I would say, let's let's not focus on the end of the movie. I think that there are so many redeeming characters in this, uh, in this movie. And what I would say to every single man and woman who fought in Afghanistan, you won for us. You, you gave us a victory. And that victory was stopping terrorism from coming into the United States. That was their goal. They were sent there to make sure that there wouldn't be a, a safe haven in Afghanistan so that the terrorists would never be able to do another 9-11. They wouldn't be able to come at us. We took the fight over there instead of having the fight come to the United States. And the American uh, military won that battle. They did everything right at great cost, incredible sacrifices, limbs and lives. And uh, I think that what we have to remember is that it was the politicians at the end that messed this up. The politicians who decided to keep our men and women there and to change uh, the goal. The goal was no longer just about fighting the immediate threat to US national security, but it was suddenly you know, trying to get little girls to go to school and importing democracy. All noble goals, but I would say that's not what American men and women in the US military should be doing. The State Department was sidelined. USAID was sidelined. Uh, we have to think through these issues uh, more strategically and figure out what part of the US government should be involved. We have a whole huge mission at the United Nations. Maybe it's the US at the UN should be much more involved in getting the UN to do it. Now, we know that the UN does not function unless there's US leadership. But uh, maybe we adjust our goals and we, we only include the international community and say, let's do the best we can. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I think uh, just focusing on little girls going to school in Afghanistan by having the U.S. military there is not enough because little girls in the Congo can't go to school. Where do we stop? We have to have some sort of rules for engagement uh, of U.S. military men and women on the ground with guns trying to enforce something. And I think that we have to drop back and remember that the goal is just to have U.S. national security not threatened. Yeah. I think that's an interesting point to, to start winding down here with you, Rick. And one thing before we, we end, I want to talk about you were uh, ambassador to Germany, you involved the UN, you've dealt with our allies. Uh, we're seeing a lot of outcry from our allies. We're saying, uh, you know, responses from MPs in, in the UK, we're seeing a uh, response from France and from other countries are saying, this is not how we're going to handle it. And also we need to not be turning to the US now to help solve our problems. Somewhat you watch that and go, well, these countries should be operating independently and you know, it is it is their own country to worry about. But you also worry about the strength of America. You worry about the superpower kind of concept that we've built here. And if they've lost hope, have we lost our allies in these kind of situations when they see how you know, horrible we, we handled this, this big ending in Afghanistan? This is such a big, important, thoughtful question we could do a whole segment on what the allies have done and, and the groundwork that they've laid. I hope that our allies are able to be thoughtful about their role in all of this in the last 20 years, because let's be, let's be honest, um, our allies all have a country first foreign policy and domestic policy. In Germany, where I know it well, they have a Germany first policy. Now they mock America, for having an America first policy, but every country around the world has the their own country first as a motto. We're the only country that gets in trouble for actually articulating the America first policy. When Donald Trump was asking other countries to step up and do more, and remember the America first policy is also about allies doing more, NATO doing more, meeting their obligations. We got a big pushback from many allies who didn't wanna do more who are very comfortable with America doing the most and leading the way. Many, I can tell you, I spent eight years at the UN. Many of the world's problems 
uh, are brought to the UN and the UN sits around and waits for the United States to come up with a plan. And then they critique the plan and they say hey, why this isn't good. And then when we finally settle on something, they say America should pay for it. And so this is not something where the allies should escape their own process to say what went wrong and what could we have done wrong. I'll finish by saying this, many allies really wanted Donald Trump out and Joe Biden in because they wanted a softer America. They wanted an America that would govern by consensus and allow them to be uh, participating in these decisions. Well, they got that. They got a leader who doesn't put America first and clearly we've seen in Afghanistan a disaster. Now many of our allies are saying, oh, this is terrible. Um, you know, what, what, can ha what can we do differently? And I would say that they need to look long and hard at why an America first leader like Donald Trump is better for them. And, and I think that's the challenge of our diplomats. When we talk about America first and we go out around the world to represent America first, there's a way to tell other countries why America first is better for them, especially for NATO allies who are part of our commitment to keeping Western values strong. They have to remember that an America first helps protect them. It means greater capitalism for everybody. A, a more solid human rights record for uh, those who want to follow an America First agenda. And it certainly makes the world a safer place. Thanks, Rick. I really appreciate you spending your time and sharing your expertise with all of us.